name is George Lizos. I'm a spiritual teacher and intuitive and the author of Be the Guru, a step-by-step -step guide to becoming your own spiritual teacher. And this is a live recording of the Lit Up Lightworker podcast, bringing you fun and soulful interviews with spiritual teachers with the aim of tuning you in and lighting you up. And without further ado, let me bring on Charlie Molly. Hello, Charlie. Welcome to the Lit Up Lightworker podcast. Hey, George. How you doing, man? It's great to see you. I'm good. It's so great to see you. And I'm so excited to dive into a lucid dreaming today because it's been a topic I've always been interested in. I've started uh, experimenting with astral projection when I was mm. younger and then lucid dreaming a little bit. So I'm so excited to, um, to discuss the differences between the two as well later on. Now, let me start this officially. Welcome, everyone, to the Lit Up Lightworker podcast. Charlie Morley is a best-selling author and teacher of lucid dreaming and shadow integration. He was authorized to teach within the Kaju School of Tibetan Buddhism by Lama Yeshe Rinpoche in 2008 and has since developed a holistic approach to dream work called Mindfulness of Dream and Sleep and written three books which have been translated into 13 languages. He's spoken about lucid dreaming at Cambridge University, Buddhism and youth culture at the House of Parliament, is a regular expert panelist for The Guardian and has been named one of the next generation of meditation teachers. In 2018, he was awarded a Churchill Fellowship grant to research mindfulness-based PTSD treatment and continues to teach on retreats for armed forces veterans. For over 10 years, Charlie has run retreats and workshops in more than 20 countries and continues to teach internationally. Charlie, it's so great to have you on the podcast, and I'm so excited to dive into with the first question. Uh -huh. Now, lucid dreaming. <clears throat> Many people have heard the term, but in my experience with chatting to spiritual people over the years, they have um, different opinions and different ideas as to what lucid dreaming is. So I want you to start from the basics. Could you give us a definition of lucid dreaming and a mm -hmm. foundation as to what it is and how we can use it? Mm -hmm. So a lucid dream is a dream where you know that you're dreaming as the dream is happening. So mm -hmm. it's not just a really vivid dream. Uh, it's not an out-of-body experience. It's not a prophetic dream, although those, all those things are great. Um, it's specifically a dream where you're in the dream and you go, aha, this is all a dream. And once you know that it's a dream, you can then start to interact with the dream at will. So you can decide what to do. You could fly about, you could meet movie stars, you could just use it for fun, or you could use it for deep healing. For example, you could call out to meet traumatized parts of yourself and embrace them with love. You could work with recurrent nightmares. That was the link to the uh, veterans I've been working with. You could do your spiritual practice in the lucid dream. You could meet your inner child and work with childhood issues that are still holding you back. And um, you can ask questions like, what career path should I take? And the dream will give you an answer. I mean, it's freaking nuts. The, the kind of stuff you can do lucid dreaming makes me want to kind of run out on the streets and kind of grab people. And go, Have you heard about lucid dreaming? Because it is like that. And some of the stuff sci-fi, you know, they've done studies on sports, sports science studies where they found out that if you went into the lucid dream and practice your athletic discipline, like you practice martial arts, stuff like that, you got better at martial arts in the waking state and you actually made changes to your neural pathways and stuff. Um, so yeah, a lucid dream is a dream where you know that you're dreaming as the dream is happening. That's the definition. You have to be sound asleep, not half awake, half asleep, you're sound yeah. asleep, but you go, oh wow, this is all a dream. And because it's a dream, I can direct it or I can ask for something to happen. So that's a lucid dream. Now you touched on something that I'm very passionate about, which is using um, spiritual tools and modalities as solely spiritual entertainment or to deepen our spiritual path. Now I know a little bit about your story of how you started from using lucid dreaming for spiritual entertainment in a way like- Oh, not even basically. spiritual entertainment, just sexual entertainment. <laughs> I was like 16 years old, dude. And I was like, wow, okay. It's like a virtual reality simulation where there's no rules. I'm just going to go and have loads of sex, <laughs> do loads of skateboarding. Um, yeah, I had no idea until I got into Buddhism and they told me it was this big spiritual practice. So could you tell us a little bit more about <laughs> your, your path uh, of meeting lucid dream and then 
what the journey has been and the unfolding has been in using it in your spiritual path because i know progressively you added shadow work inside as, as your books progress it, it go deeper and more spiritual what has this path been for you and what could, could could people follow a similar path or would you rather them follow a different path mm -hmm. if there is a right path so um yeah my first kind of contact with lucid dreaming was when i was 12 well, 11, because for my 12th birthday, I wanted this lucid dreaming device called a Nova Dreamer, which is like this mask oh, yes. that you put on your face. Um, because I knew I had had lucid dreams before then when I was, I don't know, six or seven, because I used to wet the bed um, till really late, till like six or seven. And I used to be in the dream and in the dream, I would really need to pee. And I'd wake up and I'd become lucid in the dream and go, oh, I should go to the toilet. But then I was too scared to go to the toilet at night because I was scared of the dark and monsters and stuff. So I'd go, well, this is just a dream. So I'll pee in the dream and everything will be okay. But mm. for any people watching this, as you know, peeing in a dream is a trap. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to pee in the dream and then obviously wake up and I'd wet the bed, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I remember lucid dreaming then. And then 12, I was asking about lucid dreaming. But, you know, if, if there wasn't my mom and dad to confirm these memories, maybe they'd be lost. But what mm. I know from my own memory, definitely, is um, 15, 16, I started to get interested in um, like Shaolin Kung Fu, which was kind of linked to, linked to Buddhism, um, UFOs, psychedelics. I started smoking loads of weed. Um, I just wanted to expand my mind. I didn't know how, but I was really interested in mind expansion. So then I got into lucid dreaming properly. Like I bought the books and I, I read some articles on the kind of young internet then. There was some stuff on the internet um, and taught myself how to do it but without any context. So I would just use it for, like I said, sex and skateboarding. Um, but when I was 17, I did have the first experience of it being used for benefit because I got really bad nightmares. I had this drugs overdose and I got really bad nightmares after it, which now I understand were post-traumatic stress disorder nightmares. Um, but I didn't know this. I just knew I was having really bad panic attacks uh, and I was having really bad nightmares like for like four months after this, this thing had happened. So I went back to the lucid dreaming books and read the night, read the chapters on nightmares because it had said that you could cure nightmares through lucid dreaming. And I thought, okay, well, look, I'll give it a shot because it's that or the men in white coats take me away. So um, I gave it a shot. And after the first few lucid dreams, it didn't work. It was just too scary. But in like fourth or fifth time I did it, I became lucid in the, dream, in the nightmare. And I said, I just had the realization, this is a nightmare. This is not real. I'm not in danger. This is my mind. And I turned and faced the nightmare. I said, I see you. I see you. Like, I don't know what I meant by that, but just kind of, well, I do. I mean, I, mean, I see you for what you are. I see you for what you are. Um, and the nightmare transformed and I never had the nightmare again. It just stopped literally overnight. So I remember thinking like, fuck, this is way bigger than I think it is. But then I just kind of slipped back into my old ways and stuff. Um, well, or maybe not. Maybe the seed was planted. Because then when I was about 18, 19, I started to get into Tibetan Buddhism. Um, by the time I was 19, 20, I was getting really into it. Um, and then I came across this term dream yoga, which was a term given to the spiritual practices within Tibetan Buddhism that have lucid dreaming as their foundation, but also out of body practice actually as well. Um, and then I learned all about the spiritual aspects and all this kind of stuff. I started training with Lama Yeshe Rinpoche. I started training with Rob Nan. Um, yeah, and then a few years after that, they thought it would be a good idea if I gave a talk. Um, so I didn't ask to give a talk, um, but they thought it'd be a good idea if I did. So I did. And then they thought I should do another one and another one. And then it just kind of snowballed. So I didn't actually set out to do it. Of course, as soon as they said, you wouldn't do a talk, it was like childhood dream come true because I've been obsessed by this stuff since I was 12. But I just didn't have the audacity to ever think I'd be able to actually do it as any sort of career path mm. or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how it turned out in the end. Now you mentioned nightmares. So are nightmares related to the shadow? And also I was checking out your, well, rereading your uh, Lucid Dreaming Basics book. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the three, uh, three different dream signs, anomalous, thematic, and recurring. Are these related to the nightmares? And are they related to the shadow as well? Is there a correlation between, like a connection between them? All of it, apart from the dream signs. The dream signs one is okay. slightly separate, so I'm just going to move that to there for now, but yes. we can look at that in a minute. As far as the nightmares and the shadow, absolutely. Mm. I mean, the, shadow, um, 
the term popularized in the West by the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung, he defined the shadow as anything within the mind that we have rejected, denied, or disowned. Mm -hmm. He described it as the dark side of the human psyche, but not dark meaning bad or evil or, or malign, just dark meaning yet to be illuminated. So the part that we hide from ourselves and others, the part that we don't want to look at. So our nightmares are primarily made up of shadow material, because what is a nightmare? A nightmare is a dream that the dreamer finds unpleasant or fearful. Like we literally can't define a nightmare. You know, let's say um, um, <clears throat> you're, you love cats and you have a dream about cats, that's a lovely dream. But let's say you have a fear of cats, then that's a nightmare. So we can't say what's a nightmare, but we can define it as a dream which the dreamer finds unpleasant or fearful. Um, so when we are having a nightmare, the content of the nightmare often reflects our shadow material. Now, the cool thing is, if you can become lucid in the nightmare and go, oh, wait, I know I'm in a nightmare right now. I know my body is asleep in bed, and I know this is all a three-dimensional projection of my own psychology. Well, if it's scary, it's probably shadow. And if I'm meeting my shadow, that's what Carl Jung said was one of the greatest healings we could have. And one of the, the main aspects of his um, psychological system was asking us to face and embrace the shadow. Now, if you can get lucid in your nightmare, you are literally facing your shadow, like in, in seemingly physicalized form. So if you can get lucid and then move towards the shadow with love, with courage, with fearlessness, you can uh, do very powerful shadow integration work. And Carl Jung said that shadow, the integration of the shadow was <clears throat> synonymous with um, individuation, which was his term for like self-actualization or mm -hmm. So basically, yeah, if you can get loose in a nightmare and you can embrace your shadow, you're going to do deep work. So as a rule of thumb, can we say that um, you can only encounter the shadow self in nightmares or could the shadow self show up in more positive kind of dreams? Like, is there a correlation, a direct correlation between negative dreams and emotions in the dreams to the shadow? Or does the shadow sometimes appear in other forms? Yeah, no, there's no correlation between negativity and the shadow. Okay. Um, there's the term the golden shadow, which Carl Jung never used, actually, but it's based on a quote from Jung <clears throat> where he said, the shadow is 90% pure gold. And then his later students then came up with this term golden shadow. Um, the shadow is not bad. I mean, if I ask you what you hide from yourself or others, we might go, oh my God, okay, it's my, it's my uh, sexual perversions, it's my anger, it's my prejudices, all this kind of stuff. But actually, we also might hide our brightness. We might hide our esoteric side for fear of being rejected. We might hide our talent for singing because it doesn't fit in within the social framework uh, which we live. Uh, we might hide elements of our sexuality because we're not stepping into the empowered ownership of them yet. Now, all of those things are shadow material because they're things that we hide. Our talents, our esoteric side, our sexuality, but they're in no way negative. Um, so absolutely, the, the shadow is... Um, so absolutely, you can encounter the shadow in a very positive way. I mean, we need to move beyond these ideas of positive and negative when we work with the shadow because it's just too subtle. Um, it's more like revealed and unrevealed. And the shadow is usually what is currently not revealed to us. That's something I really love about your work and your message, Charlie, is that you bring the, you bring the light into the shadow. Like you encourage people to have a more positive relationship with the shadow because when people hear shadow self, it immediately elicits a negative feeling within yeah. you and people are scared to go there. They feel yeah. like, oh, it's just a really dark side of me that I, I just rather keep hidden. But when you keep hiding it, it keeps growing stronger. And I love that you're bringing it um, into a context of, uh, into a friendly context in a way, so that we yeah, can- Yeah, and we're, we're, made, we're, we're made to feel ashamed of our shadow. The shadow is made by shame. Every time you are shamed or shame yourself, you create shadow content. And yet when we discuss our shadows with others, they often shame us for discussing it, mm. which is ridiculous. So it becomes this, this downward spiral of, of, of shadow unintegration, shadow creation. So I say we need to learn to love our magnificent messiness because we are all messes, really. We act like we know what the hell's going on, but we don't know. Most of us are complete neurotic messes, but that is okay. And yes. being on the spiritual path and being a neurotic mess are not counterintuitive. In fact, if you're a neurotic mess, that's probably what got you onto the spiritual path. 
So let's stop hiding and acting like we're all fully awakened yeah. and go, okay, look, we're aiming for awakening, but right now we're in neur neurotic messiness and that's okay. And that makes it okay for others to be like that. And you realize when you open up, to the possibility of being a neurotic mess as being okay, then awakening occurs because we're actually stepping out of self-judgment. So it, it's weird. It seems like a paradox, but um, yeah, that's my, that's my approach to the shadow. I love it. Normalizing the, the shadow self. I'm reading a book right now by Debbie Ford, uh, Why Good People Do Bad Things. Oh, which, yeah. <laughs> exactly that. We're all good people, but if we keep suppressing that shadow, then it shows up. And yeah. I love it, lucid dreaming in such a powerful way of, of meeting it, of having a conversation with it and bringing it into the light. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we touched on previously about the, the, the dream science, which I find is a very practical tool to, to give away to people because we all love talking about dreams, yet we, we, we don't have a framework to think about the signs we receive in our dreams mm -hmm. and how these relate to lucid dreaming. So could you run us over the three types of, of signs you mentioned in the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a dream sign is anything that can reliably indicate that you're dreaming. Hmm. So let's say you wake up from a dream and uh, you've had a dream that you're walking down the street with your friend. Uh, you wake up, you write down the dream and you look for dream signs. You think, well, there aren't any because my friend exists. We often do walk down the street together. But then the next night you have a dream, you're walking down the street with your friend. At the end of the, the street, there's a uh, President Trump riding a blue dragon and you wake up and you write down the dream and you go, where are my dream signs? Okay, clearly President Trump and a blue dragon because those don't exist in my daily life. So most people's dreams are full of dream signs. Unless yeah. you have a super boring dream about just being in the office in the whole dream, there are prob probably dream signs, either anomalous, like one-off crazy things like President Trump appearing yeah. on blue dragons or thematic where the dream might seem normal but the entire theme of the dream is what's weird. Like if you have a dream, you're back at school and school is totally normal and you're acting totally normally, but you're back at school. So that's the dream sign. That's the indication that, that it's definitely a dream. And then the third ones are recurring ones. And this is how you can get lucid. Does anyone listening now or watching now and they think, yeah, I always have that crazy dream I'm back at school. Or I always have that dream of my dead grandma. Or I always have that dream of being naked in public, whatever it is. What you can do tonight is as you're falling asleep and you pass through what's called the hypnagogic state, which is actually a natural state of hypnosis, brain goes into deep alpha theta, exactly the same as hypnosis. And as you fall asleep, you can be implanting a hypnotic suggestion that the next time I see Donald Trump, or, or if between now and breakfast, I see uh, my dead grandma, or if between now and breakfast, I'm back at school, I must be dreaming. You kind of, in, you kind of implant that in the mind that the next time you see whatever your dream sign is, you, you must be dreaming. So you create a direct trigger between the dream sign, Donald Trump or a blue dragon or, you know, naked in public and dreaming. Dream sign equals dreaming. And once you create that connection, that connection will become activated in your sleep. So you'll be in the middle of a dream and your dream sign will turn up and suddenly something will trigger and you'll have this aha moment of, oh, no way. I always dream of my uh, being naked in public. This is it. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. That's like the classic lucid dreaming technique. Um, and it seems like it seems people think, oh, how is that going to work? Okay. Let's say you owe your friend like 50 euros or something. And you go, okay, the next time um, I see a cash point, I've got to get out some money because I owe it to my friend. Now you can forget about cash points, but actually the next time you see a cash point after this interview, you'll probably think of me because I've now created a, a, a connection between cash point and Charlie. So we use that part of the brain all the time. So that's all we're doing. We're creating connection between the dream sign and the fact we're dreaming. And then we allow ourselves to go to sleep, but that part of the brain stays active. Well, it doesn't say active, but it, it stays aware of our, of our goal, the goal oriented part of the brain. So that can be a great way to get lucid tonight. So it's basically using the recurring dream as the door to open, um, to, to, open to, to get into yeah, a lucid dream, exactly. basically. But of course, to get there, you've got to first remember your dream yeah. and definitely start writing them down. So there are two steps before dream signs. That was my other question. So my other question was, so you talk in the book, in the basics book, about um, remembering your dreams as the foundation to start mm -hmm. practicing a lucid dreaming. Could you explain to us why this is so important? And also, how can people start remembering their dreams more? Mm -hmm. So if a lucid dream is knowing that you're dreaming as the dream is happening. The easiest way to get to that level of insight is to know loads about your dreams. 
And to know loads about your dreams, you've got to be remembering them. You've got to be writing them down. You've got to be talking about them. They've got to become a central preoccupation of your, of your day uh, for you to become lucid at the night. So people are thinking they don't dream. Everybody dreams. There's no way to stop the human brain dreaming because it's linked to our evolution in biology. Um, but for people who don't dream or think they don't dream or don't remember their dreams, sorry, I should say, um, I'd just say this. When did you last try? And usually you get this kind of blank look of like, yeah. I don't try and remember because I don't remember my dreams. And you think, well, you can see the, the flaw in your logic here. So as you fall asleep tonight, I'd invite everyone watching this, as they fall asleep through that hypnagogic, again, that hypnotic state to be saying over and over again, tonight, I remember my dreams. I have excellent dream recall. Tonight, I remember my dreams. I have excellent dream recall over and over again for a few minutes as you fall asleep. <clears throat> if you do that, there's a very good chance you're going to remember your dreams. And then the next step is to write them down in a dream diary or, or into your phone or something like that. And then once you've got them written down, you can start to see those patterns. Oh, there's a dream sign. There's a dream sign. Uh -huh. there's a dream sign. So that's like the first three steps. And in this way, you can even see if you have any recurring dreams and then start the process of, exactly. uh, of accessing the dreams that way. Yeah. So practical. I love this. Um, now, let me move into uh, an objection. I think the biggest objection that people have to lucid dreaming is the idea that we spend all our conscious state thinking about stuff. So why would I do that in my dream state as well? Won't my mind get tired? Yeah. Won't I get tired? What is the response to that? Is that okay. true? So we spend about two and a half hours a night dreaming based on an average eight hour sleep cycle. Of that two and a half hours that we spend dreaming, none of that is restful. Like REM dreaming sleep is not a restful sleep state. Mm. If you look at someone's brain when they're dreaming, it's highly active. It's actually more wow. active than our brains right now when we're just having a chat. Um, so we know that dreaming is not restful anyway. Now, ironically, they found that once you become lucid in the dream, because it's like a state of meditation, knowing what's happening as it's happening, knowing I'm dreaming as I'm dreaming, the brain often moves into displaying meditation brainwaves such as gamma, which is actually really good for the brain and leads people to wake up feeling really refreshed. So the irony is often lucid dreaming makes you more refreshed than non-lucid dreaming. Wow. You know, if you had a really hectic dream and then you wake up and you're like, oh, whoa, that was so hectic. I was being chased yeah. and then this was happening, then yeah. my this person appeared and I was back at school and it almost feels like you're kind of tired. I mean, you're you know, psychologically drained from the dream. If you were lucid in that, that feeling of psychological draining would be negated because you would know that it was a dream. So strangely, it can actually make you less tired. However, learning to lucid dream can be tiring. Because I'm going to ask you to be waking up at certain times of the night, doing certain meditations, writing down your dreams, yeah. stuff like that. Learning any form of yoga, including dream yoga, is a little bit tiring for the first few weeks we try it, but do we just not do anything in life because it's gonna be a bit tiring when we first start? It's like any skill, we need to put in some effort. But the cool thing is, lucid dreaming encourages you to spend more time in bed. If you have two extra hours in bed, you double your chances of having a lucid dream. So anyone out there who's only getting six or seven hours sleep, if you give yourself nine hours sleep, you're gonna double your chances of getting lucid. And most of us are chronically sleep deprived. So yes. any carrot that we can dangle to make us sleep more and spend more time resting in bed is worthwhile. Um, so actually lucid dreaming is for people who love to sleep and it's about maximizing sleep, maximizing our potential. Gosh, I love that. And I had no idea that we're actually more relaxed. Uh, yeah, it's weird, we're... isn't it? And I, I didn't know that uh, REM about dreaming, it's tiring, which now that I think back on it, uh, uh, about it, it is quite tiring, especially when the dream isn't very positive. Yeah. Now yeah, let's move to um, a topic that I've, I've had a chat with you in the past about that I'm fascinated um, about is uh, astral projection and how that relates to lucid dreaming. So I practiced that back when I was 17 years old. I was just, again, spiritual entertainment. I just wanted to get out of my body and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And just like with lucid dreaming, there's a similar kind of practice that you do that you check with yourself um, mm -hmm. several times during the day. And then I would get out of my body and then you would have to, again, you would, there were a lot of lucid um, practice meditation that you have to do during the day so that when you got out of your body into the astral plane, you could remain lucid and not drift back into um, a dream. What is the relation 
if there is a correlation between lucid dreaming and astral projection and can you switch between the two in the same way for example that i would do i would be astral projecting and then drift into either a lucid dream or just an unconscious dream mm -hmm. yeah okay so firstly my wife is the one to ask about this because she's the one who's doing a master's in uh, transpersonal psychology studying the obe state wow. um so actually she'd be worth getting on the show to ask uh, all about that yeah uh, She's not here. She's actually just gone out. So I will answer on her behalf. Um, you know, the jury's out on this. A lot of people uh, say they're two sides of the same coin. They're similar. What is consciousness? Maybe this is all a dream, blah, blah, blah. Those answers are great. And we can get into high philosophy there, but we can actually bring it right down to something super simple. Essentially, a lucid dream is happening in here, whatever that means. Lucid dream has neural correlates. We can see it's happening kind of in your personal brain. Um, and we know it's your personal stuff in there because when you go into a lucid dream, it's made of your fears, your fantasies, your baggage. Um, you can change stuff because it's a projection of your mind. And also we've got scientific proof that lucid dreaming exists. OB state, out of body experience, astral projection, one, we don't have any science on it. The mm. second is when we look at the brain correlates of someone having an OBE, they're not dreaming. So we know it's definitely not a dream. Um, they don't know what it is because they haven't mm. proved it yet, but they, they, know, they know it's definitely not a dream. Um, in a valid outer body experience, there's that sense of shifting out of the physical body and then sometimes being able to look back at your own body lying yeah. there. And you're not asleep. I mean, this is the one big thing. Lucid dreams only happen in sleep. OBEs can happen in the waking state, in the meditation state, and in those boundary sleep states too. So again, it doesn't have to happen in sleep. So that's a big difference. Um, I had had like 500 lucid dreams by the time I had my first OBE. So I was in a relatively unique place because I knew the lucid dream state really, really well. And I thought the OBEs were just lucid dreams. And I went to this guy's workshop and I'd been emailing him saying, look, I'm researching for a book. To be honest, I think they're the same. I'm a bit of a skeptic about this. And I go to this guy's workshop, Todd Akamesis, his name is. He's now a good friend of mine. Um, and at midday, I was not tired. I was not, was not a placebo because I thought it was rubbish anyway. You know, so I wasn't kind of sucked into this. Um, I had a full on out of body experience. Now it wasn't long and I just came out about three inches out of my head. Um, but everything that was me went <laughs> was ripped yes. and went like up, up. Even my vision went up. So I could, cause we're in the circle, I could see above the guy's head in front of yeah. me. I was wide awake. I was not dreaming. I was like, oh wow, okay. That ain't no lucid dream. So I have had some OBEs which are full on waking state out of body experiences. I've also had full on totally asleep lucid dreams, but there's also something in the middle where we can be in a lucid dream. Actually, I mean, there's a Buddhist practice where you go into the lucid dream, do a certain meditation and have an outer body from the lucid dream because the lucid dream is a much easier state to separate from the gross corporeal form mm. than the waking state. Um, and in the same way, you can be an OBE and it's much easier to drop from an OBE to a lucid dream than OBE to waking state because the, en the energetic makeup of an OBE and a lucid dream are way more similar than yeah, the OBE yeah. in the waking state. I mean, the waking state, you've got a, f you've got a solid body. OBE, you're made of energy. And in the lucid dream, you're kind of made of both energy and, you know, you're in your body, but you're experiencing energetic form. Um, so it can, it, it can feel confusing, but yeah. it actually doesn't have to be. There are definitely OBs, there are definitely lucid dreams, and there's definitely something in between. But I, I think we, we throw the kind of baby out with the bathwater when we say, oh, they're all just the same. Um, I mean, if this is all a dreamlike illusion, empty of inherent existence, and I am dreaming you into existence, you're dreaming me into existence, then yeah, it is literally all the same because we're in the dream right now. But in, <laughs> until we fully prove that, I think it's quite good to make distinctions, but who knows? Yeah, and, and whatever the case, it's just amazing to see how much we can achieve by training our mind and how much potential yeah. we have to, to access consciousness that is both within and outside of ourselves in a way. Exactly. Charlie, thank you so much for chatting to me today. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, so my website, charliemorley.com. 
Um, someone recently said, if you just put into Google Charlie Lucid, then all my stuff comes up. So that's an easy way to remember. <laughs> I um, love it. And your <laughs> most recent book is a repackage of the basics book, which I, I it is, uh, if I remember correctly. Lucid Dreaming Lucid made, made Easy. Made Easy. Yeah. And made then there's the Shadow exactly. Book. And I'm on Facebook and Instagram. And you, I'm very easy to find. Of course. And I'll post all the links in the, in the show notes as well. Charlie, yeah. thank you so much for chatting to me today. It was so exciting diving into this topic. I'm fascinated by it. And thank you so much for giving us all a very grounding basis and practical tips that we can use actually tonight. Yeah. To attempt to dream. I know I'll be trying those. <laughs> thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much, George. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to everyone on Facebook. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.